Okay, so this is Genesis chapter 16, or lesson number 16. If you're using your Bibles, Genesis chapter three, open up there. And as always, I'll put the scriptures on the board or on the screen if you want to see those. We're going to do a little review first, just a couple of minutes of review, and then move into tonight's lesson. So last time we were talking about Eve's temptation in Genesis chapter three. And I told you that she made five mistakes that provide a pattern for most sins. Remember, most, sin, most sinfulness is patterned after this, or most temptation, not sin, but temptation, is patterned right here. So let's take a look at that first of all. So first of all, uh, the, her first mistake, failure to rebuke sin when it appeared. The devil spoke to her and said, hey, you know, I got something nice for you. And she said, really? Let me take a look at that. So sinfulness, you know, usually attractive and desirable or powerful, and many times what gets us is our lack of uh, quick and decisive action at its first appearance. Usually that's our downfall, we pause. I remember a, a long time ago, you know, I, I wrote a sermon about the one minute. It's the, the game is won and lost in 60 seconds. The temptation game is won and lost 60 seconds, from the appearance or the thought or whatever, you know, the draw to the temptation, whatever it is, the whole game is played right in the first 60 seconds. And for Eve it was the first 60 seconds. Instead of saying, whoa, wait a minute, no, that, get away, or I'm walking away, uh, she began to engage. And I said that an effective rebuke requires three things. You know what a rebuke is when you tell somebody this is no good or you take them to task. An effective rebuke uh, uh, requires knowledge of what is truly good and evil. You got to know what's right to know that you're being tempted to do something that's wrong. Secondly, conviction of your own position. No weenies here. You know, this is wrong, it's always been wrong, I've been taught it's wrong, I've taught my children it's wrong, and now that I'm facing it, hey, I'm, I'm not going to go back on what I've always thought about it. And thirdly, immediate response. You got to call a spade a spade. This is wrong. Number two, compromising God's word. She compromised God's word. We went into it in depth last week, not going to do that this week. But when we want to sin and still remain Christians, we usually change what God's word actually says. We kind of fudge a little bit, you know? Uh, and I talked about you know, Christian homosexuals. You know, they have their own theologians and commentaries and so on and so forth to defend their lifestyle, okay? Uh, so if we want to continue our bad habits, you know, a lot of times we just block out the parts in the Bible that deal with our bad habits, that's all there is to it. Or we, we categorize, well that's, that's a small thing, that's a little thing. You know. A lot of times we, we confuse grace, for example. We think grace means that God has tolerance for our, our, our small bad habits. I'm under grace, you know, God doesn't care if I then fill in the blank, you know, I swear, I don't know, I'm picking something out of the air. You know. I use bad language, let's just say. Well, that's not murder, it's not adultery, you know, it's, not, it's, a, it's a thing you know, with me. When I get mad, I use bad language, it's what I do. You know. Aren't we under grace? Well, we are under grace, but we understand that grace is not a license to indulge in our bad habits. You know. Uh, the idea of grace is that we're, we're still saved while we're dealing with our bad habits. That's a, that's a better, that's a better uh, look at it. Uh, number three, uh, playing, you know, considering the pleasure of sin. Remember she said we looked, we talked about shopping last week. You know, if you don't want to buy, don't look. Because if you look, you'll want, and if you want, you'll buy. When I say to my wife, I think I'm going to go to Kohl's. <laughs> You know, she knows that's the end. You know. she, I have my own credit card. You know, it's the only credit card that really is mine. You know what I'm saying? She doesn't have one. I have the Kohl's card. You know, it's for me. And my daughter-in-law, she knows. You know, she, for my birthday, she gave me a gift certificate you know, for, for Kohl's. So what's, what's the temptation there? Well, the temptation is to stay on the gift certificate. right? Because now I have the excuse to go. Well, I've got a gift certificate. I can't just leave that thing laying around. I've got to go. I've got to go look. So, but well, you understand what I'm saying, right? Don't go for a test drive if you're not going to buy the car, because you're going to desire it if you try it. 
So in a more serious vein, don't play with sin. Don't play close to the edge because pretty soon you'll be acting out. Pretty soon you'll fall over the edge. Some people, you know, they kind of live right on the edge for everything. You know, not quite crossing the line, but they're right there. And, and you, you wonder. You know. Number four, uh, the consent to it. If we don't initially refuse to sin, eventually we'll just give in to it. You know, there's only two ways to go. You do or you don't. And if you don't, then say no, because with time you'll eventually say yes. So the trick is to decide ahead of time that you'll say no, then when you're faced with temptation, you won't weaken yourself by considering the pros and cons. You'll just say no. And again, I, I, I mentioned again, we talked about, you know, when I teach a, a, you know, a teen class or something, young people, I tell them, hey, make up your mind way ahead of time what your answer is going to be so you'll know immediately what to say and what to do in a, you know, in a, in a situation because uh, especially young people, more vulnerable emotionally, less experienced, so on and so forth. In their mind, they may have made up their minds, oh yeah, I would never do that, but sometimes when they're right in the action, their emotions overwhelm their, their thinking. So it's very important that their thinking is, you know, is, made, uh, is made up on the issue. And then number five, uh, let's start a club. You know, it's no fun to sin alone, and so the next step is always to find a, symp a sympathetic partner who's going to let you sin in peace or who will join you in that sin. You know, as I said, Romans 1.32 mentions that phenomena. You know, those who sin even encourage others to do the same thing. That's how bold they become. All right, so sin is the original problem and the method has always and will always be the same. Always the same, that's why I've kind of reviewed this, it's always the same. You have in Genesis 3 the pattern for temptation, it's always the same. No matter what country you're in, what time you live in, you know, we're, we're thousands of years later after this was written and it works exactly the same way in our lives. Amazing. Now, as I said, since the original problem always will be always will be the same, but one other thing we learn from this sequence is that sin also always has a consequence. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, the consequence in chapter three. Now I would normally say that the next section is entitled The Consequence of Adam's Sin, but there is not enough paper to list the individual consequences that resulted from that sin. I mean, we don't have enough time, there's not enough time in, you know, to, to list all the things that, that went bad after that sin. Suffice to say that the two major consequences were that paradise, that sinless place of joy, was lost, and the world, the physical universe, was also lost at that point. At that point, the downward cycle began. Imperceptible at first, you, you couldn't hardly see it at first, but slowly but surely. You know, we talk about evolution, you know, things start from simple and they get complex. Well, the reality is devolution began at that point. Things were perfect, perfectly balanced, perfect harmony, and after sin, you know, the bolts, the wheels started to come off, and the wheels are still coming off. The wheels are still coming off in this day and age. When I hear people saying, you know, we're going to save the world, we're going to save the environment. You know, really? No, you're not. The thing is way too far gone to save. Manage, yes. Mitigate, yes. Save, no. Not going to happen. So Genesis records in sequence the consequences and the events that took place after this disobedience. So the first thing that took place, shame. Shame. Chapter 3, verse 7a, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. They knew from experience, you know, in other words, they tasted the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They had experienced good and now they were going to experience evil. That was the thing. They thought the knowledge of good and evil was this other thing over there that would give them wisdom, they'd be like God, okay? 
But the, but the lie was, you know, the trick was, they already had the good. <laughs> they had the good. And once they disobeyed, they were going to know the evil. And that's what started. The evil started. So their experience was shame. Shame that comes from knowingly disobeying God. That's the, the bottom line. The shame that comes from disobeying God. You ever ask yourself, why am I feeling guilty over this thing? Nobody knows, it's my business, I'm not hurting anybody, whatever that sin is. You know, it's the shame of knowing that He knows. He's seeing you, He's watching you, He's judging you. It's one of the most difficult things for new Christians. New Christians, uh, in, especially if you become a Christian as an adult, I'm not saying so much if you're a young person, but if you become a Christian as an adult, there's this tremendous weight on you because you realize as an adult that God knows everything you're doing all the time. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh man, that's such a burden when you become a Christian as an adult. I remember when I became a Christian, you know, I was 30 years old, and it was like, it nearly drove me nuts the first year. You know, it's like, wow, I can't go anywhere and hide from you. Would you just leave me alone? Let, let me go to this dark corner over here for a little while. You know, I just, is there somewhere where there's no light? That was, that, I'm serious, that was like a heavy burden. You know, like every mistake, every sin, every bad thought, every jealousy, every yucky idea, everything, you know, like he knew it. And of course, that was the training ground for learning about God's grace. That's my point I was making before. Grace is that despite the fact that all of this yucky stuff is still in your life, He's still saving you. And it's a very humbling experience, very humbling. Eventually, uh, I, I, I would say, I don't, I don't say I had two salvations, but I had two awakenings. One was I was saved, I realized, oh, oh yeah, tonight, this is it. I've, I'm obeying the gospel, I'm repenting, I'm being baptized, I'm, I'm obeying the gospel, that's great. But a couple of years later, he brought me to my knees when I understood there are just some things I can't fix in my life. I can't fix them. They're either back there in the past and I can't go back and refix them, you know what I'm saying? And I was trying so hard to make up for that or fix that. And eventually I remember, you know, I, was, I remember where I was, you know, I just got on my knees and I said, Lord, I just, I can't, I can't fix this thing. And I remember the words that came out of my mind. And the words were, I guess I'm just going to have to accept your grace. <laughs> I guess I'm just going to have to let you save me because I can't do it. I, I can't do it. And, the, and the, the, the alternative is that I'm lost. So I'm lost, I try to do it myself, or I allow you to save me despite the fact that I'm not perfect and I know I'm not perfect. And I am not perfect in a lot of ugly ways. So I guess I'm just going to have to let you save me. Wow. Yeah. So shame. They learned about shame. Their experience with, was the shame that comes from knowing that God knows that they disobey. And why was their nakedness the focal point of their shame? Because their sin was not a sexual one. You know, a lot of Catholic theology, theologians uh, 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 teach that the sin in the garden was the sexual sin. And from that comes a lot of Catholic ideas about human sexuality. But their sin was not sexual. Well, one idea is that they realized that as head of the human race, they had corrupted the future generation by their sin. Because they were intelligent enough to understand what they had. We're the first. We're the original. It begins with us. We have a brand, it's like you're having a brand new car and the first day you, drive, you, you, you back it out of the garage, you smash into the pole. You know, you know what I'm saying? That feeling, oh no, my new car. Well, imagine, multiply that by a thousand times. Wow. So this realization centered itself around their reproductive organs which symbolized the future generation. 
Another idea is that they realized that they could not hide their sin and their nakedness was a reminder of this. Either way, the Bible says that they felt embarrassment and shame for having done wrong. And the nakedness part was simply symbolic or you know, the outworking of that. Just like sometimes you're embarrassed and what happens when you're embarrassed? The physical side is you kind of get red, you, know, you've, you, you blush. Well, they were blushing, they were ashamed, and the blushing meant they, they recognized they were naked. The second consequence was guilt. It says, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The fact that they tried to cover themselves means that they felt guilty. They knew that they had done wrong and they felt bad about it. And it's probably what saved them. Could you imagine if they would have said, what do you mean, I didn't do anything wrong. Imagine saying that to God, what would have happened to them? Who are you, who are you calling a sinner? <laughs> Had they been proud like Satan and, remorseless, and uh, remorseless rather and haughty, God would have destroyed them there and then. Bzz, would have been the end. Note that they tried to cover themselves and this always is inadequate. You know when you try to cover yourself? They covered themselves but they were still afraid. When God covers you, you don't have to be afraid anymore. Okay God, I'll let you save me. And that didn't happen in 24 hours. You know? It took months and years to get to the point where, you know, I'm letting you save me even though I realize how yucky I really am and you know what, maybe you can get something out of me. Maybe I can do something, you know, I, can, I can offer something. I know it won't be perfect and it'll always be spoiled by human imperfection and so on and so forth, but maybe I can offer something that'll be good. Thirdly, they experienced fear the consequence of sin. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Shame and guilt produce fear. Fear, because a feature of man's conscience, that's where his will operates, is that man intuitively knows that sin equals punishment. That's why we're afraid. Every, I'm looking around, everybody here has raised children. Some of you, little, not as far down the line as others, but you will know, you will learn, you will learn that children, you know, once they get to the age of reason, you know, it's funny, isn't it? Before they get to the age of reason, they'll disobey you 50 times a day and jump in your lap, no problemo, you know what I mean? You know, but when they get to the age of reason, when the conscience really starts to work on them, you kind of know, right? You walk in and you go, uh, so and so, Susie, whatever, you know, you say, Susie, is everything okay? Because you can tell on their face, right? You can tell on their face that something is wrong. They're afraid. And why are they afraid? Because they're ashamed. And why are they ashamed? Because they feel guilty. And why do they feel guilty? Because they did something wrong. It could be kid stuff, you know, I ate the cookie before dinner, or I slapped my sister, or whatever. You know, in our house, that didn't bring a lot of guilt, but anyways. <laughs> Unfortunately, so shame and, and guilt bring fear. God said that disobedience brings death and that knowledge is part of man's psyche. All men's psyche know and, and has experience of the dread of punishment. The normal fellowship between Adam and God did not include sin. But now that sin is present, Adam cannot hide it. He knows God's will and consequently he's afraid. The knowledge of the tree of good and evil. He had the good, he find, now he's finding out what the evil is. The evil is shame and fear and guilt. He was afraid not because of his physical nakedness, he was afraid because his nakedness now reminded him of sin and sin reminded him of death. Don't forget, this is before Jesus now. I go back to my own story. The only thing you know, that gave me comfort was 
Jesus died on the cross for all of my sins. Everything I could think of about me, past, present, even what I was afraid the future might bring, all of those things I was reminded by the gospel, Jesus has died for those things. You know, the restitution, you know, the payback, Jesus has done that for me. I have the memory of it, I have the, you know, it's, I'm responsible for it, but the restitution, He's done for me. I don't have to make restitution for my sins, but Adam had no such knowledge. Imagine the fear in him, no such comfort for him. He was just afraid, period. And then another consequence of sin, excuse me, I forgot to read the second part of that. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid myself. Sorry, I should have read that a little sooner. But anyways, there's the, the scripture I was working off. Okay, the fourth consequence of sin, more sin, more sin. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So it doesn't take long for sin to multiply itself. Remember I said the wheels come off? Well, now you see the wheels starting to come off here. Immediately, Adam begins to show signs of his moral deterioration. When asked about the tree, instead of confessing and asking for forgiveness, Adam does two things. First, he blames his wife. Somehow that has remained a part of the human landscape in the last many generations. He blames his wife. And secondly, and more seriously, he blames God. Instead of praising God for His goodness and, and throwing himself on God's mercy, he blames God for his troubles. This woman made me eat. You know this woman that you gave me? Don't you hear the echo of our own character in that? How often we've done that, not necessarily with our wives, but you know, at work or at school or you know. When posed with the same question, Eve does not acknowledge guilt. She doesn't say, I am guilty, I disobeyed. I, can, is there something we can do? What can I do to seek your forgiveness? Right? She doesn't do that. She blames the serpent and offers the excuse that she was deceived. He seduced me, he, you know, he drew me in, as if she had no willpower. She had will, she could have said no. So sin has already reduced them to denying their own guilt and blinded them to God's goodness. They don't even appeal to Him for help. Imagine now, these are not these are not individuals who, like us, have a fallen nature to begin with. They had no fallen nature. And yet, in, after the first disobedience of God, already their, their, their moral compass has been skewed. They, they don't even think of asking for forgiveness. One other consequence of sin, and that's judgment. We'll talk about that in the few minutes we have left. So the first thing they learn about evil is that it always results in the judgment and punishment by God. There's the knowledge of good and evil. Evil e equals judgment. And, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, quote, law and order politics, you know, the idea between, behind law and order politics is just that. You know, when evil is not confronted immediately and quickly by justice, it, it's rampant. If a thief steals something and it takes nine months for that person to go to court and then delayed and, da -da 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 and they get their punishment and then they go to jail for two years, but you, know, you only get to serve one third of that and then with good time and you get, you know, you get conjugal visits and so, you know, and you wonder why you know, evil spreads. Well, it's right there. So God pronounces judgment in the same order that the sin preceded. It begins with Satan then to Eve and then to Adam. Because Satan is the one that began with the idea of seducing the woman, so he's judged first. Then the woman, she was seduced into sin. And then Adam, he was, he was not seduced, 
he was talked into. It's not the same thing, okay? So let's read that for um, uh, Satan is judged first. So it says, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and uh, her seed, excuse me, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now the snake's posture, whatever it may have been before, will now be that of one slithering in the dust, trampled underfoot of other animals. He was, he was the most uh, intelligent of the animals, it says that before, and now he's going to be at the mercy of other animals who just step on him and so on and so forth. So this is the imagery of the position of Satan, who once was an angel, now he will be hated, he will cause fear and repression as the snake does in normal circumstances. I know there are snake lovers out there, I understand that, but human beings' natural reaction to a snake is usually repulsion. And there are some people that you know, handle snakes and so on, but most people, you, know, you walk it, <gasps> you do this when you see a snake. And God said, this is, this is the same thing. You see a snake, and what is it? Well, you, it's Satan. The idea is you see Satan and that will be you know, the, the, the Lucifer, the day star, who was the most beautiful of angels. Now, if someone comes in contact with him, it's, <gasps> it's that. that. That's your judgment. That's how far you have fallen. And symbolically, like the snake, you know, being trampled underfoot by, an, never mind by men, by animals, by other an, dumb animals, you know, cows, are they about the dumbest thing? You know, they're going to they're trample on you. Okay? So the, the imagery there of how far Satan has fallen from the highest of the heavens to the lowest place, if you wish. Now we get a glimpse of Satan's original plan when we hear the curse. There is special emphasis on Satan's inability from here forward to dominate woman and the offspring that she will bear, which is probably the reason why he attacked her to dominate her and control her, ch her children for his own purposes. Remember that battle that's going on with Satan. So God says that there will be war, not subjugation, between the woman and her children and Satan. In other words, you will not dominate the human race. You won't dominate it. That's what you were trying to do, but you're not going to do that. You will not succeed. The struggle with, will end between Satan and the seed of the woman between you know, mankind, with the seed of the woman destroying the seed of Satan. So there's a, you know, a little between the lines, you have to take a look here. It's interesting to note that in the Bible, men have the seed, not women. And spirit beings have no seed. They don't procreate, only humans procreate. Angels don't beget other angels, okay? So the seed of woman is Jesus, who was conceived without a human man. So woman is you know, in total. The ultimate seed of woman will be Jesus, because women don't have seed, men have seed. But the seed of the woman will be Jesus, because he will be conceived through a supernatural uh, manner, if you wish, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The seed of Satan is the man of lawlessness, or the Antichrist, to whom Satan gives power and who will be destroyed by Christ's coming. There's the end game. The seed of woman, Jesus. The seed of the evil one, Satan, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, you know, whoever you want to, whatever way you want to describe him in the Bible. The bruising is a blow. For the woman's seed, it says the blow will be on the heel, which is the inferior part of the body. If you get an injury to your heel, I mean, it hurts and this and that, but you're not that incapacitated, right? But if you get a blow to the head, and you know, if I took a hammer and I went bang like that on your heel, it could break your heel, whatever, you know, but you'd be in a cast, you could still probably do what you need to do. But if I took the same hammer and hit you in the head with it, it would be fatal. So the imagery here is the seed of the woman 
will receive a blow from the seed of the, of the serpent, but the blow will be on the heel. It'll, it'll incapacitate, it'll hurt. Well, you know, they killed Jesus through the machinations of Satan. Jesus was eventually uh, crucified, but he rose from the dead. It was not a total loss. But when the seed of woman, when Jesus judges Satan, the blow will be fatal. The judgment will be eternal. His end is absolutely, absolutely insured. So Jesus, when He returns, destroys death, will pronounce judgment on Satan, who will ultimately be thrown into the pit forever. Very interesting that this prophecy is made at the very beginning of Genesis. And I tell people, you know, the, book, the Bible is about Jesus. And it starts talking about Him in Genesis 3, well actually even before then, but you know, referring to Him as the seed. All right, Eve is judged. Let's move on. Verse 16 says, to the woman He said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Amen, ladies. On pain you will bring forth your children, or in pain should be, you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So both Adam and Eve were brought painlessly into a perfect sinless world. But because of this sin, the creating of future society would be marked by pain. Because of her sin, death enters the world and pain at childbirth is the constant reminder of this fact. Isn't that amazing? We have a machine that has gone past our solar system, okay? And we'll be traveling gazillion miles away taking pictures but a woman having a baby still hurts. Isn't that amazing? Now, before sin, man and woman enjoyed co-rulership over creation. Because of sin, this perfect balance is upset and God now has to establish a rule of law in the relationship between man and woman. So the husband will rule, he will be the head, and God establishes his leadership after the rebellion of Satan and Eve. So man will have, man doesn't take it, God gives him that, that, that leadership role in the family to avoid anarchy. So this concept is repeated and confirmed in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians, the book of Ephesians, same idea, Paul repeats the same thing from Genesis. Now, there have been many abuses of this idea to this day, but again, the Bible clarifies the loving relationship that is to exist within a husband and a wife. You know, the, wife, the man is to love his wife as Christ loved the church, meaning he is ready to die for his wife. He is in service to her and so on and so, and so, on and so forth. And she offers her submission to him in her love for Christ as a demonstration of her faith. You know? And I've always said, if a Christian man deals in a Christian way with his wife, she will have absolutely no problem in being in submission to him. It'll be a joy to be in submission to him. There'll be balance in the family when it comes to that idea. One kind of little note here, the women's movement, especially the very uh, aggressive women's movement, is actually the human solution for this problem this imbalance between man and woman. The, 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 it's a humanistic way to solve the imbalance between man and woman, and it usually leads to other problems, other imbalances. There's also mercy in God's judgment over Eve. He says, she will not desire the serpent and his promises, but rather will return her focus to her husband. Because her love was pulled away from Adam and went to the, to the serpent to the, the desire to be greater and so on and so forth. And so God says, I'm going to break that hole that he has over you and permit you to give that love to your husband once again. So she would not be enthralled in possession by Satan, but rather go back to having a relationship with her husband. And also the pain of childbirth will not overcome her love of her husband and her love for her family. Otherwise, every child would be an only child, right? Hey, let's have, this, let's have this baby business, let's try that. And then after the first baby, the girl says, okay, no more of that, that hurts too much. Isn't that one of the great mysteries of life, you know, that 
women continue to have more than one child, you know, out of the love for their husband, love for children, love for family, willing to go through that kind of pain. And, and, and it's dangerous, even, even to this day. Childbearing is still uh, very, very dangerous. So what God does here is He puts a limit to her suffering. She's the one that's been given the privilege of, you know, God created Adam first, but then every other man comes from a woman. So there's balance there in privilege. She has the privilege of bringing children into the world, but God has mercy on her uh, for this task uh, and says that her suffering will be limited and she will still be able to have love and compassion for her children and her husband despite the sin that she's uh, been involved in. All right, so next week we're going to look at man's judgment. I didn't want to rush through everything, so we'll do man's judgment. Satan, Eve, man next week. We keep moving.